22 minutes to the top of the hour. Over the course of an illustrious 50-year career as a journalist, possibly the United Kingdom's most experienced and award-winning broadcaster, Jeremy Thompson has been in the thick of it. In his sometimes poignant, sometimes hilarious, but uh, always entertaining memoir, Breaking News and Autobiography, Thompson takes us on a journey through his career where it all began. The first person to broadcast live as British peacekeepers entered Kosovo to witnessing the birth of South Africa's democracy, including former President Nelson Mandela's inauguration, to attending his funeral. Jeremy Thompson is once again in South Africa, and what an honor it is to have him sitting here on the couch. Well, it's a pleasure to finally meet you. And yeah. Get on morning live. Tell me so about it. Nice. I mean, I've been watching you for for years. I mean, you were working when I was born, and the reality is, I hate to say, you. sorry, I hate to remind you, but <laughs> I realised that I started in television news the year you were born. It's scary. And I'm not going to tell them when it. Was. Oh well, yeah, you're, it's okay with me. <laughs> but I mean, you've been in the industry for covering events for 50 years. Yeah, yeah. You have seen the world changing with your own eyes. Extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it's. I feel at the end of it, when I was writing the book, I thought, well, what a privilege. You're a lucky guy. You know, you came from nowhere. You thought you'd work on a local paper. You kept getting lucky and getting breaks. And you end up seeing history being made around the world. You know, I was in Tiananmen Square in 1989. I was in the first Gulf War, the Balkan War in Iraq in 2003, the tsunami, you know, London bombings, American presidential elections. But I mean, my fondest memory is my four years based here and seeing this extraordinary transition. I mean, when I was a youngster, I never thought I'd see the end of apartheid. I never thought I'd see the end of troubles in Northern Ireland. And both finally changed. And to be here as a chronicle of those events and to be you know, on the front line of history changing, to better tell that story to people. It's a, I mean, it's a heck of an honor, really. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It's incredible. And I want to spend a lot of this time speaking about South Africa mm. and your experience and times here and documenting. But first, I, I want to go back to the beginning for you, because, I mean, your, your journey into journalism is a story that I fear a lot of young journalists now miss out on, because you started, as everybody did, right at the bottom. And for me, what I was giggling in the beginning, hearing you you covered weddings and you had to yeah, find yeah. out if they were legitimate weddings. That, yeah. was your, that was your job. Absolutely. No, I started <laughs> on a local paper and I got a four-year apprenticeship. They called it indentures, which sounded rather curious, but I got a four-year apprenticeship as a teenager. I didn't go to university. I thought, no, I want to be a journalist. Much against my father's better judgment. He thought it was dreadful. I mean, he saw us journalists as bottom of the pile, so yeah. he really didn't like it very much. But I decided to give it a go. And yeah, you used to, Friday used to write up the wedding previews, you know, the families would send in their pro formers and you'd write up, you know, aspiring hockey player marries leading batsman in the local, you know, that sort of <laughs> stuff. And then Monday, we were, it was drilled into us uh, by the news editor, you had to check them. Because you realise that about one in a hundred weddings don't take place because yeah. something goes badly wrong. You know, the, the bride runs off with the best man or some, you know, the vicar falls ill, something like that. So if you don't check, you can put a wedding in the paper that never happened. So I learned the basics about journalism. And that's, check, that's check again. That's the definition of journalism 101, which yeah. perhaps we're missing out on right now, <laughs> is prove the story's true before you put it out there. Well, in the world, world of fake news, I mean, how... Difficult and damaging is that, and how, what a challenge to mainstream journalists to prove things are true, yeah. because fake news doesn't check anything, whereas it was drummed into me, you've got to check everything three times, and you've got to have three different sources before you can go with the story. Fake news just is the new propaganda, the new misinformation, and it, and it is diverting for people, and it is challenging for us to try and make sure that we're honest and fair and get the story out for people. Yeah, yeah, which is, I mean, that's, that's the reality, is the danger of fake news and the danger of, of the, the, the anger that it creates amongst people. Mm. Because if you don't, and, and that's unfortunately where journalism, I imagine, is under threat, is because if you just rely on social media, your view of the world is going to be skewed. Yeah, I mean, social media is fantastic. It's a great tool. It's a great convenience for us all. But it does allow the carriage of non-factual, post-factual information, if you like, fake news. And 
I think it's just a modern variation of this misinformation and propaganda. But what it has is the instantaneous impact, the yeah. immediacy, the insidious nature of being there right in front of us, easy to use, popping up on our devices as we go about our lives and hard for people to have time to check. I think, if anything, the traditional bit of news like our bit, you know, breaking news and what you do, is almost getting slower because we're having to be more thorough in checking to challenge the fake news that's out there. Yeah, which is vital. I mean, mm. we, we, we had a lesson this week where, uh, you know, very quickly a fake news story was put mm. out on social media um, and journalists picked it up and started running yep. with it. And then, of course, the apologies had to quickly come in fast and furiously. And, yeah, and, yeah. and that's the danger. That is a big, big danger. You know, we talk about things being fast these days. I mean, in the beginning of your career, when you particularly started, you could disappear for a week on a story. Yeah. Um, and you did. And yeah. you covered the most incredible <clears throat> things. These days, there is no way you can do that as a journalist. No, no, no. I mean, I found it. the joy has been being sort of groundbreaking in breaking news, having moved from the old traditional appointment to view evening shows, you know, the nine o'clock news on BBC I worked on, ITN's famous news at 10. It was great, but you had all day, if not all week, to do a story. By the time, by the end of my career, <clears throat> you'd fly in somewhere, there's a satellite dish. I mean, I ended up doing, uh, doing live broadcasts of terror attack in Paris on a smartphone because you could and nobody questioned it. Mm. So it's instant. You're there and they expect you on and they expect you to deliver. So the chance of building a story in a way has become more difficult because of the nature of the technology that allows us to be anywhere in the world. Whereas <clears throat> when I was based here and I'd go off to Sierra Leone or Southern Sudan or Somalia or into Rwanda um, when the genocide happened, Quite often, you didn't have the wherewithal to broadcast live. So you did go in and you spent a few days gathering the material, then you'd come out and put it on air from the next convenient satellite station you could find. So, I mean, it's a very different process to now, where you arrive, you plug in, and you talk for your life for the yep. rest of the day or the rest of the week without a pause. You Finding know, so. angles in every yep. direction you yep. turn. Yep. But it, it's, it's quite mm. incredible. And, and, and a wonderful lesson again to learn is, is, is to find the story. Because, mm. I mean, when you started your career, your, your boss was quite hard on you and said, get out of your car and walk. Yep. Walk. Speak to people, look, use your eyes, use your ears, pick up the story, it's around you, it's everywhere, it's in the pub, it's in a drink. Um, and perhaps we forget that sometimes and we live too much on press releases. Yeah, yeah, no, I think there's a lot of lazy journalism now. I think the great deal of press release, video press release journalism where it's easy, you know, you're under pressure for time, you just go, oh yeah, fine, take a line out of a press release, turn it around, turn the video around. And you don't go out and find what I would call grassroots stories, yeah. you know, the original source of a story. I thought there was nothing more fun, more satisfying as a youngster was finding a story yourself that nobody else had done. That's it. There is a danger that by the time you get to the top of the business, you know, you're a bit of a star and everybody likes you, knows who you are, but you end up, in a way, the danger is you're in a processing plant processing somebody else's grassroots news you're rarely delivering it first yeah. you can be every now and then you can be first on the scene but it's less likely yeah so it changes the nature of it uh, we're going to take a very quick break when we return i really want to turn our attention to your time here in africa mm. and your time here with with nelson mandela because i think that that was you've described him as one of the best people that you've ever met and mm. ever been with and he knew your name from the beginning yeah. and always used it so stay tuned conversation with jeremy thompson continues